This justice anthem first rang out in 478 BC during the reign of Persian king Ahasuerus, ruler of 127 provinces from India to Kush. Queen Esther, who had just been promoted from the king's harem to now queen of all Persia, is made aware that the Jews are facing a threat of genocide for no other reason than their nationality and culture. Her cousin Mordecai comes to her and says, don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Realizing that her people are victims of targeted systematic and institutional extermination, Queen Esther must learn quickly that her economic status cannot save her. See, she has to learn that marrying a rich Persian man can't save her, that earning a Persian degree can't save her, that having Persian friends can't save her, that living in the most respected Persian house cannot save her, that no matter what she does, who she associates with, and what she puts on to assimilate to the surrounding Persian culture, no matter what she does, Esther is a Jew. She is susceptible to this decree. She must learn quickly that the fact of the matter is that injustice against any Jew is a threat to justice for every Jew. See, if Dr. Martin Luther King were writing during Esther's lifetime, I believe Mordecai would have quoted him in their dialogue. I believe that he would have come to her trying to get her to understand her susceptibility to the decree and thus her own inability to avoid the consequences of it. I hear him telling her, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I believe that this is a truth that many of us have failed to see in 2020. See, as we all know in scripture, the Jews were made up of 12 tribes in Israel. These tribes are named after the 12 sons of Isaac, right? So what we have is when Moses liberates the Hebrews out of Egypt, millions of Jews are following him, but they are dispersed into 12 different tribes. The Bible teaches us that Esther was belonging to the tribe of Benjamin, all right? So just like the Jews, Africans are a large and dispersed people who occupy many lands and are a part of many tribes. There are Africans on every continent and in almost every country. In fact, according to Harvard's African Languages Program, the continent of Africa is one of the most linguistically diverse continents on the globe. On the continent alone, there are anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 different languages spoken across 54 different countries that are home to approximately 3,000 different tribes. This does not include the languages and dialects that have formed amongst the descendants of Africans in the Caribbean, Central and South America, and these United States. The truth is that the terror of colonialism and enslavement created a global culture of a a global African diaspora that has even further diversified African people, making us a global nation of many tribes. Hear me. This means that it's easy for black people to believe that we have more differences between us than similarities. But see, the reality is that while we like to talk about whether or not you eat callaloo and I eat collard greens, and while you're running around talking about you like roti while I like rolls, and we keep trying to create this difference between us, the reality is that we are all being globally, systematically targeted for extermination and disenfranchisement for no other reason than our race and 
nationality. Regardless of if you speak Patois or Creole, we're all in the same boat. The fact of the matter is, you just might have gotten dropped off before me. And the tragedy is that there aren't many willing to stand up and say, for my people. There aren't many willing to declare the protection and preservation of the black, of black people based on our collective Africanness. Instead, we like to focus on our distinct blackness finding that if there is an African that is facing destruction and extermination from a different tribe than us, it then becomes a fatality outside of our jurisdiction for justice. An issue that is none of my concern. What do I mean? See, African Americans are being falsely arrested, beaten, and even murdered by law enforcement, and Caribbeans are averting their eyes because African Americans are boisterous, uneducated criminals who need to be taught civility. Caribbean dreamers are being deported and African Americans are averting their eyes because Caribbeans are ungrateful for all the work African Americans did to even allow them to immigrate to the U.S. in the first place. Oh, we gonna pretend today? Is that what we gonna? <laughs> the, choir, the choir had me in the morning. We gonna, we gonna pretend in the afternoon. I thought y'all was gonna be honest with me in the afternoon. Okay, that's fine. See, the reality is that we are all intentionally allowing injustice to happen to one another because we do not identify as one. But at some point, we've got to realize, like Esther, that exploitation in Haiti is just as important as gentrification in Harlem. We've got to understand that a travel ban on Nigeria is just as unjust as food deserts in New Orleans. We've got to understand that incarceration in Baltimore is just as unjust as illiteracy in Barbados. We've got to understand that hopelessness in Chicago is just as unjust as homelessness in Cape Verde. We've got to be willing to stand up and say, for my people, and it include Jews outside our our Benjamite tribe. Because the fact of the matter is, we are all dispersed Africans, affected by the same decree, all affected by the reality that, the, that this nation is globally and systematically attempting to destroy us for no other reason than our race and nationality. We all need to heed the wisdom of Mordecai, where he says that for your silence in self-preservation, this will bring you nothing but destruction on your own house. Esther's declaration for my people shows us that her commitment to saving all of the Jews from every tribe, not just the Jews from her home of the tribe of Benjamin and not just the Jews residing in the palace courts, uh, Queen Esther committed to delivering, delivering her entire nation from destruction because she found community and oneness in her Jewish identity as a whole. She understood that the call to save the Jews was not an exclusive call looking to bring salvation to some, a select few, a distinct population. No, the call for salvation was a call to all the Jews. This is further seen when Mordecai and Queen Esther get King Ahasuerus to agree to not just sign but draft counter documents decreeing the Jews' protection. In chapter 8, beginning at verse 9, the Bible says, On the 23rd day of the third month, this is the month Sivan, the royal scribes were summoned. Everything was written exactly as Mordecai commanded for the Jews to the satraps, the governors, and the officials of the 127 provinces from India to Kush. The edict was written for each province in its own language and to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in King Ahasuerus' name and sealed the edicts with the royal signet ring. He sent the documents by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, bred 
bread in the royal stables. The king's edict gave the Jews to each and every city the right to assemble and defend themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate every ethnic and provincial army hostile to them, including women and children, and to take their possessions as spoils of war. Verse 13, a copy of the text issued as law throughout every province was distributed to all the peoples so the Jews could be ready to avenge themselves against their enemies on that day. In other words, Esther did not just fight for salvation for every single Jew, but she and Mordecai made sure that their salvation was legally binding and distributed in their own language because salvation does not require assimilation. Oh. Saints, work with me. Salvation does not require assimilation. See, I don't know about you, but I feel like there is a black Christian expression that we have not tapped into because we are bound to a European expression of worship. Oh, they don't want to talk back to me today. That's all right. Because, see, the reality is that God desires that you encounter and experience him in a way that is unique to your culture and experience. When I look in the Old Testament, I look at the story of Hagar. Hagar is sent away into the wilderness. Her and her son are dying. God comes to her and provides for her, says that he is going to give her and her son a promise. In that moment, Hagar identifies God as El Roy. She says and names him, this is the God who sees me. In other words, this Egyptian, he, this Egyptian slave has had an encounter and an experience with God for herself. And instead of believing that Ra, the Egyptian God, is the God who sees, she has an encounter with the God who created the world and she names him for herself. How many times are we going to continue to come into church, worship, and encounter God in ways that are unique to Europeans and not to us? How many times are we going to allow Persians to dictate how we come to God, what we name God, how we know God? At some point, we've got to say that I am black, I have had this experience, and this is how I know God. This is what I will call God. This is how I will worship God. I will not speak of him in the language that you have given me. I will speak of him in the language that he gave me. I will accept his salvation and I will engage with that salvation in a language that is my own. Yeah. 